happy Friday to you. Oh my goodness, it is Friday, May 7th. How about that? Um, and happy early Mother's Day to the mothers out there uh, on our Mother's Day weekend. Um, it is good to be here with you. My name is Jess Jones. I am the center director with the Coffer Resource Center here in Chicago, Illinois. And we are here to support union professionals and performers in the pursuit of work. Um, if you're with us, you're probably one of those union performers and professionals. And so we are happy to have you here. We are happy to share space with you and we want to be sure to continue to do so both in these settings and one-on-one. -on -one. Uh, so in order to get engaged with us, we need to know who you are and how to get a hold of you. Um, if you want to stay in touch with us uh, virtually, you can follow us at the Coffer Center uh, social media pages, at Coffer Center, Facebook and Instagram. You can also subscribe to our newsletter at CofferCenterChicago.com and information will get right to your inbox when we have programs and events like these for you to join us at. Um, and as we look ahead to the future, we hope to be able to share space together uh, before not too long. Um, so if you want to know what we're up to in our space, be sure to stay tuned to those uh, places because we will let you know what there is to know when there's something to know about when we're going to all reemerge and be able to share spaces again. Um, and that is something that we can all look forward to as the weather changes, as uh, we are all kind of reemerging slowly but surely from the spaces and places in which we've been safely uh, guarded during this season of the pandemic. Um, also during this season, we have been so blessed, so grateful to have this space um, to continue to connect. Um, and I also have my friend, Dr. Greta Pope, to thank for creating this specific space, uh, Soundcheck, on each Friday. It is one of my placeholders in the week that I look forward to. It is kind of like a warm conversational hug that leads me into the weekend. Uh, so without further ado, I'm going to invite my friend, Dr. Greta Pope, to the conversation so that we can, can kick off another week together. Greta, how are you doing today? I'm great, Jess. How are you? I am good. I am good. I am, uh, you know, looking forward to a sunny, serene Mother's Day weekend, and I hope that you are as well. I certainly am. I'm, uh, I'm very excited about this Mother's Day in particular, and uh, I will share a little bit more about that once we get going with our sound check today. So how is your family? Everything good? We're we're good. We are hanging in there over over here in Albany Park. You know the weather is nice enough that we're starting to get some evening walks in and yeah. and you know little a little bit of adventuring as a family again. So it's nice. nice to have have something like that to look forward to as as the weather changes and you know literal and metaphorical seasons are shifting kind of you know in our in our world. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah, makes all the difference. Well, I want to thank you and I want to thank Henrique as well. Henrique is always behind the scenes but he does such a great job. So thank you, Henrique. <laughs> well, it is our pleasure. And thank you for always anchoring this week. Thank you for kind of being the bookend of my week. Uh, I'm going to hand it off to you and let you take us into our okay. hour. Okay, sounds wonderful. Thank you, Jess. Hey there, and welcome to Soundcheck. I'm Dr. Greta Pope, and I'm so excited to have this opportunity to visit with creatives from a variety of disciplines about their professional journey. We are in the midst of a pandemic that has changed all of our lives and the ways in which we work. We will use this forum to share our thoughts, feelings, and best practices for surviving this challenging time. I am very excited today to talk with Edward W. Wimp Esquire. He is particularly near and dear to my heart as he is my son. Ed is the newest member of the Coffer Center Board of Directors. He is a lawyer and an MBA. He is a singer songwriter. He's an avid golfer. He has been road manager for the iconic band Earth, Wind and Fire. He has also been road manager for hip hop artist ASAP Rocky. Ed is the author of Building Fans, Fame and Wealth, The 18 Revenue Streams of Music. Let's welcome Ed to Soundcheck. Good morning, Edward. Good morning, how you doing? Good, how are you today? I'm good. Good, good, good. It's so good to see you on the screen. <laughs> you know, I have to tell our viewers, my husband, Ed, and I have spent the majority of this pandemic era at our lake home in Michigan. And I am delighted to report that Edward is visiting with us this weekend for Mother's Day. 
So we went and picked him up this morning at the airport. And I just, you know, I couldn't be having a better Mother's Day weekend. I'm so excited that he's taken this time from his busy schedule to spend this holiday with us. So Ed, thanks again for joining us today. Share, share with our viewers your earliest recollections of exposure to entertainment. Sure, well, thanks for having me. Um, really is a pleasure to be here. Uh, you know, music's been in my life as long as I can remember. And starting out uh, as a young age, uh, you, Mother uh, brought me out a lot of times, you know, to uh, go on cruise ships and and um, on different tours that you did. So, you know, music's always been something that has just been second nature to me and it's just been part of my life since since I can remember. Um, so, you know, I mean, my earliest recollections were just being a kid, you know, taking naps backstage at shows and and uh, that's really just been it. Yeah. Yeah, those are great days. Those are great yeah. days. So how have those experiences informed your life choices? Sure. Well, I think, you know, for one, the cool thing about entertainment and music is that it does open up a lot of opportunity for travel and a lot of opportunity to see things that you wouldn't ordinarily see if you stayed, you know, wherever you're local to. So, um, you know, it, it really impacted my life experiences just to give me a more worldly point of view and uh, to see different things, different people, different cultures, different foods. Um, and also it gave me a perspective that, you know, working, you know, a typical nine to five job doesn't have to be your lifestyle. You know, you can travel while having a career that's fulfilling and live a life that's outside the norm of what we all kind of, uh, of what a lot of people resign themselves to when they look at a career. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. That's great. So tell our viewers when you began playing music yourself. Sure. So I think my first instrument was violin. Hated it. <laughs> and um, it was the worst. But, but you know, but, it, but, it, I, but I fell in love with music through the process. So I didn't like the instrument itself, but I liked the, the notion of music. Um, and then I took vocal lessons, started to grow on me a little bit more. Um, and I took trumpet which really grew on me a lot more. Um, I really enjoyed that. And then um, I started playing guitar around, I don't know, 11, 12, 13 years old. And um, I just fell in love with it. You know, and I've played guitar since. Uh, so I play guitar, bass, still sing. Um, and I like, you know, just the, the freedom that it, that it gives you, you know, it, it's, it's such an expressive instrument. You can express so much emotion through it. That's great. That's great. So how did you decide to choose a career on the management business side of entertainment? So I think um, I saw uh, that I had a skill for it. I think a lot of just with any other product that you're trying to sell, whether it's music or whether it's, you know, anything, you know, just having the concept, having the product itself is, I would say, not even half the battle. So, you know, whether you're selling, you know, a cell phone or you're selling a song, um, no matter how good that cell phone or song is, it doesn't matter, like no one's going to hear it unless you are able to bring it to market. So I think I saw for myself an, op an ability to be able to do that. And I enjoyed playing music. I enjoyed writing music, recording music, but I also found a knack for myself in bringing that music to market and bringing you know, and making a business out of it. So that's really kind of part of the part of the way that I got to the business side of it. And then also um, just people that I that I knew in the industry that gave me opportunities to exploit uh, the skill that I had. Mm -hmm. Well, that's going to be my next question. Um, how did you get involved with Earth, Wind and Fire? How did that happen for you? Sure. So a family friend um, was tour manager of Earth, Wind and Fire. And I uh, was about to graduate college and I'm aging myself, but in 2012, <laughs> and I didn't really have um, any plans following college. Um, if you ever seen the movie, The Graduate, that was kind of my, my fear of just lounging by the pool all day and, and not really having anything to do. So I was about to graduate college and um, 
you know, I, I hit up this family friend and basically just said, you know, I didn't think he'd say yes, but I just said, is there any way that I could, you know, come out and work with Earth, Wind, Fire this summer? And he said, you know, yeah, come, there's a show in Chicago, um, maybe like two weeks after I graduated college. So he was like, come to that show and I'll show you some stuff, you know, behind the scenes. And I did that. And then following that show, he invited me out later that summer to go on the rest of another, another leg of that tour. So that's really kind of how I got into uh, that, um, you know, group of uh, outstanding people and musicians. And it just kind of went from there. And then I kept working with them. And through that same connection, I worked with ASAP Rocky, which was a completely different, you know, it was really cool dynamic to go from Earth, Wind & Fire, who they've been doing this for 40 years and they've got it pretty down pat to then going out with a bunch of, you know, 20, 21 year olds that, you know, can't, <laughs> that, that it's just very different. Yeah, trying to figure it out. They're trying, trying to, to figure it out. out. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, trying to figure it out. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Well, now you've been all over the world with Earth, Wind and Fire. Yeah. Tell us about your most memorable experience with them. Yeah. You know, if you have more than one, you can tell us about more than one, but you sure. know. Um, well, I think one of one of the really cool experiences. I've got several. Um, one one of them was certainly I grew up a big fan of the Beatles. Um, I'm still a big fan of the Beatles. They're great, and we did um, a show at Abbey Road Studios, and it was just absolutely incredible just to be there and be, you know, in, you know, like our dressing rooms were like the studios that a lot of these artists have recorded it, you know, so it's not like, you know, there's no like red tape or anything that, you know, it's like, we're just literally just hanging out all day in these um, beautiful studios within Abbey Road Studios. And um, Earth, Wind & Fire covered Imagine that night at the studio. And it was just this real experience. And it was one of those times when, you know, after the whole show was done, I really just like sat down and had a glass of wine and just like alone, you know, and I just, took time to soak it in. And that's not always common, you know, many times, um, you know, something really cool happens when you're on the road, but it's like, you gotta keep moving, you gotta keep going to the next thing. In that show, we were staying in London after that and everything was taken care of. Like the band was gone. Like, you know, there, I didn't have anything, anything left, to, left to do and I wasn't in a hurry to get out. So I was able to just sit, just relax and just soak it all in. So that was a really cool experience. Um, Another cool experience was uh, we did Russell Wilson's wedding uh, to Sierra. That was really neat. Um, just so many. Where was that? Where was that? I was in Manchester. Um, so that was an experience that was, um, you know, it was iconic because like all my friends were, you know, tweeting about the wedding and like, you know, posting pictures on Instagram about the wedding. It was all over the National Enquirer, like, you know, it was all over the place, but it was cool to actually like be there. Um, yeah. Another really surreal experience with Earthwind was um, a few years ago, 2016, it would have been Ju July 2016, um, there was a horrible terrorist attack in uh, Nice, France. And um, it was at a Bastille Day ceremony and like a truck had like driven through like a crowd of people, it was terrible. So the night before we'd been in Switzerland and we overnighted to the to Nice and we got there in the morning, wake up, go in the hotel. And um, we heard about this, you know, the whole city's under a state of emergency. So they canceled the show and, but they still had um, catering set up. The show was like just down the block from the hotel. So they still had catering that afternoon. And um, so I, we still went you know, to, to eat, you know, down, down the block. And it was on the ocean and it was just like the most like beautiful, serene sight, but it was so eerie to just be sitting where there's supposed to be all these people and this big, you know, beautiful concert. Um, and we were just kind of there just eating with each other in silence after this horrible event had occurred. Um, so it was definitely one of the, one of the things that stuck with me and, um, and it was weird too, because, you know, just a month before that, 
Um, there had been a horrible terrorist attack in Orlando where I live. So, and, you know, Facebook around that time had, you know, unveiled its whole mark yourself safe feature. So I remember, you know, when, when a horrible event happened. So I remember marking myself safe in Orlando, then months later in Nice, marking myself safe. And, you know, it, it just like, it, it was just, again, you know, it's interesting, um, you know, the places that entertainment takes you and the things that you see because you realize there's no such place as paradise. You know, and I think that we all think that other countries are way better than we are. Or we think that we're better than other countries or whatever it is. Neither one's true. Bad stuff happens everywhere. Good stuff happens everywhere. And the cool thing about entertainment is that it really unveils that and that you can, it does give you a chance to travel a lot and see a lot of different things. So. That's great. That's great. Well, we recently visited with Eber Stepney on Soundcheck. She is the daughter of the late Charles Stepney, songwriter, arranger, and producer for Earth, Wind, and Fire. Uh, and you told me when I was mentioning to you that, that uh, I was going to be talking with Eber, you said, oh, I, th I think I, I know, I, well, I know Gabby, and I think that may be Eber's daughter. Mm -hmm. And I talked with Eber about it, and sure enough, it is Eber's daughter. So how did you guys meet? I mean, what a, what a cool thing. Yeah, so um, Gabby is my ex-girlfriend's friend, like best friend, or they're very close. Wow. So um, I, I invited my ex-girlfriend out to an Earth, Wind & Fire show, and she brought Gabby with her, and Gabby just mentioned, you know, that her last name was Stepney, and that she was related to some guy named Stepney. And I was like, no way, you know, <laughs> I've heard that name a million times. I'd never personally, I'll admit, done like the full research on him, but I'd heard the guys in the band always talking about Stepney. Mm -hmm. um, so I was like, no way, like it, they're gonna go crazy when they find out that, <laughs> that you're related to him. So wow. it's just a small world. Yeah, it really is a small world. It yeah. really is. So how did you decide to become a lawyer and get a master's degree in entertainment management? And how has the pandemic affected your business you know I, I know that you're doing a lot of other kinds of law as well um but you know how you know how did you well first answer how did you become a lawyer yeah I decided to become a lawyer and get a master's degree um well I, so i guess my education background i've always kind of concentrated it on two things that i think are applicable to everything so one of them being business i have a bachelor's in business and a master's in business and then I'm also an attorney. And the thing, the reason I pursued this path is because there's business surrounding everything, right? So that's why I got the bachelor's and master's. There's business in literally everything you do. Um, and same with law, you know, it's many times people think that lawyers are, um, you know, only doing, you know, personal injury cases or only doing certain things. But I think people fail to realize that, um, you know, there's in literally everything that you're that you do or consume or there's a legal component to it. You know, the chair you're sitting in, there's a patent for it. You know, the music you're listening to in the grocery store, there's licensing for that. The, um, I mean, you name it, you know, it's, it, it's around us. You go outside and breathe the air, there's environmental law, you know? So, I mean, the legal profession offers so much um, diversity in what you can do and it's in demand, you know? And there are so many times that I was out with Earthwind or with ASAP <clears throat> where, um, you know, it would come up, we need an attorney, you know, and, you know, I figured why not be that person? So that's really the, the reason I pursued the legal route. Mm -hmm. That's great. That's great. And then the second part of your question, how's it impacted? Yes. Um, and, you know, I think in entertainment, you know, it's interesting, you know, it, it's really, forging, you would think that, you know, you would think that, you know, without live shows happening and without um, records being uh, recorded quite as much or without uh, people being able to congregate together, you would think that, you know, legal services would, would dwindle. Um, but that's not so much the case. You know, I've had people call me trying to orchestrate uh, management companies or trying to go back to the drawing board to set up different different sorts of companies or entities and also getting creative with the ways in which they distribute their content mm -hmm. you know people are doing live streams and people are doing stuff like this you mm -hmm. know that 
opens up a whole different um, plethora of legal issues many times that haven't been thought of before, you mm-hmm. know, when it comes to ownership, when it comes to licensing or, or who can use what content. So, uh, yeah, I mean, it's, it, I wouldn't say that, you know, necessarily legal uh, entertainment law has dwindled, it's just changed. And mm-hmm. it's really opened the door for a lot of thought leaders and for a lot of new trailblazers to figure out exactly what the laws will be and how they'll be applied. That's great, that's great. So what do you think entertainment will look like going forward? Will live streaming continue as a viable entertainment delivery model in the post pandemic era? Or do you think people will just get back to what they've, you know, are most familiar with and what they've been doing yeah. before? Yeah, I mean, I think that live streaming will, I mean, we, we, we now know that we have these capabilities um, and, you know, what's the phrase, necessity is the mother of invention. You know, so we now have all this stuff that we've, you know, made out of necessity or begin to use out of necessity. Um, so I think it's not going to go away. With that being said, I think that you can't ever, you know, music is such a natural um, thing, you know, and, and it's, I, I always think music is intended to be consumed in person. You know, you can listen to a record, but it's not going to be the same thing as watching somebody actually do it. Yeah. You know, it's something yeah. that's, it's a very intimate process. So I think at the end of the day, you know, yeah, sure, there might be more ways to consume music, might be more ways to distribute music, might be more content to, that you can make, but that's not going to have an impact on ticket sales. You know, once people are, are comfortable going back out in public, people are going to want to go see somebody perform for them as opposed to, you know, sitting in their kitchen watching you know a live performance or something you know yeah yeah I, th- I think you're right I think you're right there's something very special about having that live experience mm-hmm. so how have you managed the emotional impact of the pandemic has it had much of an emotional um effect on you at all um hmm. I mean it's it, I, I suppose pose I, I think more so from a perspective i'm going to say that it hasn't had an emotional impact would be a lie now is the emotional impact good or bad is i think the next question okay you know and i think you know it's, it's really kind of you know allowed for people to connect in a way that they wouldn't ordinarily connect um i've talked to a lot of people out of you know that ordinarily you might just go out and hang out with your friends that live you know within 10 miles from you mm-hmm. when you don't see those people even now you reach out to the people that live back home where you grew up or people that you know live somewhere else yeah. um so it's benefited my life in that way um sure you know things you know got lonely for a little while you know not being able to you know go out things get boring um but yeah i mean it hasn't been that taxing yeah yeah well that's good that's good um what is the thing that you've missed most during the pandemic the thing that you've missed doing most um i'd say definitely going out and seeing music Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you know and just the impromptu you know not even planning to go see music you know just hanging out one day then your friend calls you and says hey let's go to this show then you just go yeah you know i yeah i do miss that um i miss traveling you know, I miss, uh, you know, I've just been kind of stuck in Florida and there's worse places to be stuck, you know, yeah. <laughs> especially during the winter. So, so, so don't, don't get me wrong. There, there are worse places to be stuck, but nobody wants to be stuck anywhere. Yeah. You know, so, um, so I would say that's, that's been, you know, one of the things that, that I miss, you know, just being able to just travel freely Yeah. You know, and go yeah. somewhere freely and just, you know, just, so I'd say that's the most difficult. That's great. So what will be the first thing that you do when the pandemic is over? Um, (laughs) hmm. I have have no clue. You have no clue? (laughs) Maybe maybe a trip, maybe a a long trip somewhere. Yeah. Yeah. I was thinking along those lines, maybe a trip. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, somewhere Somewhere far. Yeah. Yeah, maybe we can take a family trip. That would be nice. I actually, well, you know this. I won a trip to Cancun. Yes, uh, tell us how you won this trip. 
curious about this. <laughs> so, I, so I work at a, at a law firm and we had a golf outing and there was a closest to the pin award. So I hit the ball closest to the pin and, and, the, and the award was a trip to Cancun. So I've got the, I've got the trip waiting. <laughs> <laughs> that is great. That is great. So is there anything that you'd like to share with creative people, with musicians or actors or anything um, about getting ahead in the entertainment business? Yeah. Um, you know, I think, and I feel like I'm, you know, kind of preaching to the choir with this because I feel like if people are watching this, they're already kind of on the right path as far as this advice I'm going to give. Um, but if anybody should stumble in here and not be quite on the <laughs> quite on the same page, then this is for you. Um, but I think, uh, you know, always, you know, it's great. I'm not saying don't practice your instrument or your craft or whatever that is. That's great. You know, definitely keep doing that. But talent alone is not going to cut it. You know, you could be the, like, I know some incredible, the best musicians that I know don't make a living playing music. Um, and it's, you know, and, and the people that I do know that make, make a living playing music. Um, and that's aside from like Earthman and Fire and those guys. Like those guys are great, great musicians and they'd make a good living playing music. So I'm not talking about them. I'm talking about, you know, people that, you know, I may have gone to school with or people that I know from the music scene in Orlando. Um, the best musicians don't make, many times don't make a living because they're so caught up in the craft itself, but not taking care of the business side of it and not taking care of, you know, the marketing or not taking care of um, the financial aspect of it or not making a product that people want to consume. Um, at the end of the day, you need to make people want your product and not everybody wants to hear somebody shredding on guitar all day. They wanna have something that they can follow, um, a brand. So I would say work on your brand um, in addition to your actual craft itself. So work on your brand, work on, you know, make sure your legal work is correct. Um, you're budgeting properly you're allocating money in the right places. And um, so that would be the, the primary advice that I would give. Mm -hmm. That's great, that's great. You know, we have a lot of people that listen to this that, you know, do a variety of, of things. And, you know, it's so um, tempting for us as creative people to be so all about the creative aspect, mm -hmm. you know, and I, you know, I wanna have the best product that I can have. You know, I teach these, um, classes, um, the online huddle. And I have people in the class and we talk about all kinds of marketing and branding and, you know, and, and I tell them, you know, you've got to really work very hard on your own behalf, you know, aside from your actual um, talent, you've got to push your own brand. Mm -hmm. and first of all, you've got to create your brand and then you've got to really push that. And, and I think a lot of people really don't get that, you know, they don't, they don't understand, you know, they feel, well, I'm good. Mm -hmm. I can do my craft well, um, but there's so much more to it. There's so much more to it. And I, I was telling some students last week, you know, when I actually get on stage to perform, it's like, oh, this is great. This is great because all my time is spent doing the grunt work, doing all the other stuff. Not all of my time, but much of it. So, you know, you're absolutely right. I think, you know, that's something for people to realize, you know, you build the skill set, you know, you have the talent, you build a skill set, but you also are a business person. Right. And you have to be um, promoting yourself and doing all of those kinds of things. Right. Yeah. Yeah. yeah and I mean, and I think people are so quick and it's understandable. I'm not, I'm not faulting this mentality because I can understand how you could fall into this trap. But people are so quick to think that music is such like the sacred innate thing that it isn't to be sold or exploited yeah. or capitalized on. Um, but it is a business, you know, and, and it is something that if you want to make a living doing it, you need to you need to treat it that way. And there's nothing there's nothing wrong with that. You know, there's nothing wrong with with branding yourself and making a product that people want, just like Coca-Cola does, or just like McDonald's does, or just like Toshiba does, or like any any other company. There's nothing mm -hmm. wrong with doing that. Yeah. 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 And Coca-Cola doesn't, you know, spend 9 million hours, you know, perfecting their recipe. They have the recipe. They spend all their time marketing it and getting it in stores and doing all the business behind it. Yeah, so. absolutely. Absolutely. Well, Edward, I'm going to thank you for being with us. I'm going to call Jess back 
and see if she has any questions for you or if you've had any questions in the chat or anything like that. Sounds good. Well, hi guys. Yeah, if anybody hi. has anything they want to chime in in the chat, feel free. I want to go back and say, I want to ask questions about the two of you and, and, and it feels auspicious since it's Mother's Day weekend. So I want to pose this to both of you and, and you may have different answers is what is one of your favorite memories of, of music and art and work that you shared together with the other? Wow, that's a very good question. Edward, would you like to go first or do you need a moment to think? I'm just thinking about getting the opportunity to like even be you know on cruises and things like this and, and be alongside the experience of the gig, you know, the job, the work, yeah. and that being a cool experience too. Mm -hmm. But but yeah. I'll let you speak to what your experience is because you know my parents worked for the United States Postal Service, so it would literally be illegal for me to go to work with them. Uh, I couldn't touch nor see their work, uh, so I can't fathom having that kind of exposure to like what my parent was and what they did and how that would impact you know. And I think it's real interesting, but like obviously the impact that it had, you know, kind of on the trajectory of of your life too. Mm -hmm just yeah. where it took you naturally in its ways. But I'd love to hear from you guys what, what experiences that you've shared that have had an impact. Well, I have one that I'm sure that Edward doesn't remember. And I don't know if he's even heard this story. I think he has. He was about two or three years old, cute little guy. I was doing a series, a, a tour in South and well, pretty much South Florida and going to these various different venues, Miami, Fort Lauderdale, um, you know, just various areas down there. And uh, I was doing this show and I wanted him to come out and sing with me. Now, every night I would sing to Edward and then he would chime in and sing one line. So I'm going to sing for you what I would sing to him. I'll be loving you. And then he would go, always. That was his little part. So we had done it long enough that he would do it like just by rote, you know, he would just do it. So I had my husband stand in the wings with him. And I asked my husband, when I call for him, would you just send him out? So here comes Edward in his little navy blue shorts, little white knee socks, chubby little darling legs, and a, a white blazer with a little shirt and tie. He's like three years old. He comes out on the stage. I set him up on a stool. And I thought, okay, is he going to do this or not? You know, are the people going to like spook him, the lights and all of that? And I sang, I'll be loving you. Put the mic in front of him and he goes, always. And the house went up four grabs, four grabs. So that is one of my, one of my favorite. I have many favorite memories, but that was his first time on stage. And it was just, it was magical. It was magical. I'm melting already. I'm like, <laughs> very I'm literally, I'm a little bit like, okay. <laughs> well, but mine, you know, she's at daycare right now, but mine's that, that size right now, you know? And it's like, you know, I, I think it's so, I'm going to use such a trite word. I think it's so cool to hear Edward, what you've done in your life and to think of the seeds that get planted and think of the places that they, you know, germinate, like the places that they grow and where they launch from, you know, um, and knowing and looking at my little person and knowing I have no idea the impact this environment and the people in it will have on the trajectory of the rest of her life. You know, okay. it's, it's really special. So anyway, <laughs> Edward, don't let me take up more space. Let me hear from you. <laughs> oh, oh no, I was going to piggyback on what you were saying. And I, I think, you know, it is just a, I think art's such a cool thing. And, you know, I think one of the memories that I have, you know, is just always, there's always music in the house and live music, you know, and it's, you know, my mom would have rehearsals and, you know, you could, I'd be in my room, but I still hear the live music and, and just the going back and, and going through different parts of the music and, is ironing out a good performance. So I think, you know, as you were saying, just like all those like really small little like, you know, minute things really have a big impact over time and, and shape, you know, a person's love for anything. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, I, and also yeah, you know, I, my memories too, were just, you know, playing with my mother and, you know, doing different, different concerts, different places. And 
like some shows with her band, I would come sit in and play my guitar. And it was, you know, it was, it was, it was just something that, um, it was a cool experience. And my musicians were always so sweet. You know, they would encourage him, come and play with us. So I taught him to read tabs. So he was able to read the charts. I think your first gig with us, you were like 12. Yeah. Yeah, and he had on this little suit and he's playing guitar in the band, you know, which was just, it was, it was fantastic. And the guys were so, you know, just so, because these are like really good musicians, you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so for them to welcome a 12 year old to play, it was just, I, I just thought it was lovely, lovely, lovely. You, so you're, you're hitting on something else that I kind of want to double back to from when you were talking almost about the difference between tour environments with some of, I, I'm going to, again, simplify to say some of the young ones versus like earth wind. That's like their road strong. Like they, you know what I mean? They know, they know the road, they know the tour. Um, and, and hearing exactly what you're saying, Greta, about some of, you know, the folks that you're playing with and, and the energy in which they extend towards Edward at that age too. And the, the space that they occupy with the legacy of their performance career that they carry with them and the confidence and ease that that brings. Uh, and I guess this question will be for either of you too. What do you think is the difference dynamically between like younger generational performers and like legacy, you know what I mean? Strong generational performers, um, you know, knowing that both of them have the trajectory of professional, you know, pedigree before them for as long as they want to do this work to the degree that they do it. But what do you think is that differential between the environments, the skill sets, the work, work ethic, the energy, the whatever words you want to apply to it? Well, I, I will say from, from my perspective, I think that those, um, legendary, iconic bands, I think they went through their struggles in the early days as well. I don't think there's any difference. I think there's just an age difference and an experience difference. Um, you know, when you look at a band like Earth, Wind & Fire, I mean, they've been doing it for, I mean, they could do it in their sleep. They've been, this has been their life. Whereas the younger bands, they're trying to find, you know, they're trying to hit their stride. They're trying to find that comfortable spot um, that 20, 30, 40 years hence, providing that their careers go that long, that they will, they will be in that kind of groove as well, you know? So that's from my perspective. Edward, what is your, what is your thought about that? Yeah, I mean, I was gonna say kind of the same thing. I think it's too really, I was gonna say it from the opposite perspective, like the same okay. thing, but just different perspective. Okay. In that I think that, you know, now it's too early to tell what the young groups, what durability they'll have. Um, you know, I think, you know, one thing that a lot of older, groups that have stood the test of time have going for them is just a great live show, you know, and, and a great sounding live yes. show. Yes. Um, yeah. You know, you can listen. And that's to interesting too, when you bring that up too, because there is the difference, I mean, with, again, we've talked about technology and the change of technology so much, but we haven't even really addressed how much that changes the vocal performer. Right. Um, and when you're talking about some of these really great performers, they didn't have, it was stripped down. They brought it, they brought everything. They brought the fire, you know? Yeah. Um, and now there's a lot of like bells and whistles that can amplify performance. Mm -hmm. um, but to what degree is that, does that become the performance instead of the performer, you know? Right, yeah, yeah. And I think, you know, I think that's a lot of the difference, you know, is that now we're such a visual culture you know anybody can sound good but now what we really sell is image mm -hmm. of artists um you know i mean back in the day you know it was like you, many times you didn't even know what your artists your favorite artists looked like i'm sure you know mm -hmm. you, you didn't know what they're having for breakfast every day you know you didn't know like you know what they were you know you didn't have social media you know where you could like follow yeah. these people but now there's a secondary layer of um product there which is the person um it's not just the music mm -hmm. so i think with that being said, I think naturally the, the quality of music, musicianship has, has gone down um, as opposed to before when that's all that they had to stand on. It's like whoever could play the best music got the record deal, but which do you, was not do, easy to come by. <laughs> do you think the quality of musicianship has gone down or the importance of it has gone down? Um, I would say yeah, that we're I, still producing music that's as hmm. good as it, it has ever been. Oh, no, no, no. Yeah, I'm not saying quality is in... Um, I'm not saying that any music sounds better as, you know, than the next. I'm more so saying, you know, a, a musician that just might, it's just isn't good, a, a not maybe just not a good singer, for example, can make it now. Yeah, <laughs> you, get, there, there, you, can, you can get lost in it. There's a lot more passes. Yeah. There's a lot more right. that can compensate. Yeah. Yeah. Right. yeah. 
Yeah. I've had the experience. So I, uh, I recently closed out my parents' estate not too long ago. My mom had kept all of my dad's vinyl. And that was one of those things where I was, uh, you know, I mean, there are things you, it's easy to, to dismantle an estate. You know, you don't need dressers, you don't need dining room furniture. You know what I mean? But yeah. when you get to someone's vinyl collection, you're like, what do I do with this? Right. It's not just a right. bunch of records. Right. right. Um, and my dad started collecting his vinyl when he was in his twenties, you know? Mm-hmm. And so, and it was super diverse. Like his, the, his collection is so diverse, but kind of to what you're saying, Edward, you know, it, it, it really didn't looking at it, it did not matter what people looked like. I mean, yeah, they had a performance value, but mm-hmm. the reason his collection was so diverse is that there was performance value you know like there was a musicianship at play you know he was a big fan of a lot of these jam bands and you know what I mean he was a deadhead and you know so I mean there's a bunch of that in there um but like again thematically some of the stuff that he had was just a lot of good musicianship mm-hmm. you know performers that really knew their instrument and knew how to play in an ensemble and knew how to collaborate you know yeah. and and he had all these things where it's like oh you like Jerry Garcia. Well, then he had this side project with this person. And so now there's three of those records because they had their own two person jam, but you know what I mean? Like, and it was super interesting to go through because of that type of thing is that like, when you knew that you loved a performer and their musicianship, you know, there was a whole road that you could go down of, you know, whether they were fan bands or side projects or, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Um, And I think to your point now it's, it's, uh, there's a lot, there's a lot of shiny that you can lose that musicianship, that real like power of the craft, you know? Yeah. 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 Oh man, that's interesting. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. It's an interesting world. Things have changed so much, like in the last 20 years. It's kind of amazing when you think about it. It is. It is. Edward, I have another question for you. Mm -hmm. So considering that, that, the music and the art and all that exposure was a heavy hand to a degree. It feels like I can empathize that it feels like you're in a more of a supportive space than a performer space now. Would you say that's true? Yeah. Yep. Yeah. So, I mean, right now I'm not actively playing um, in a band, you know, anymore. So, um, yes, I mean, it it certainly has, has changed. Not to say that I'm opposed to playing in a band, um, I think Corona's kind of has something to do with that and, and you know, all, all that stuff. But, um, but yeah, definitely would be more in a supportive uh, business legal space now as opposed to gigging like all the time. What is that, what is that shift for you as far as that trajectory, knowing that you came up in performance spaces, but have moved because, you know, it's, I, I asked this from my own experience, because I often joke that I'm a recovering artist over 10 years sober. Like that's been my, that's been my quip, you know, I went to school for acting and then I ended up working in the supportive spaces and I'm much more comfortable here. And it's, mm-hmm. I, I get joy supporting artists who this is what they have to do like this is the calling this is the dream right right? and so that's that's the framework that I come from but I'm curious to hear from you what has led you to occupy the space you're in well yeah and I mean I think you know after a while um yeah I mean I I agree with what you're saying and in you know like in you know trying to make it as a musician like I've been in different rock bands and you know it's fun you know, when you're young and, and which I'm still relatively young, but it's fun like when you're young and, you know, can, you know, rough it, but it's also nice to not do that. <laughs> I hear that. I hear that. It's funny because, uh, you know, I had done improv and sometimes I say to my husband, you know, because so many of the shows and things would be like, after 10 o'clock at night, you know what I mean? Like, yeah. and I look at him and go, remember when I used to think that a, a start time for a show at, was 10 30 at night and that was okay like as I'm falling asleep on the couch you know watching an episode of like Schitt's right. Creek on Netflix you know I'm like I'm not I'm not that kid that can start right. a show at 10 30 at night anymore you know right. start a set at midnight somewhere at some little sidebar <laughs> stage or whatever like it's not yeah right. yeah, yeah and, and I think it's also I know like one of the earlier questions was my transition to you know law and stuff like that you know another thing that I noticed um, was, you know, I mean, the performance, performer life is not easy, you know, like if, if, you know, and and many times, um, you know, people might have the best intentions, 
to be a great family member. Um, you know, but I've seen firsthand that, um, you know, many, many times to have this one, I have this story, I'm gonna speak vaguely about it so you can't identify the person, but this person would get on the bus every night and talk about his daughter, right? And talk about how proud he was of her. Um, she would get the lead role in the musical. She would get high grades. Um, and it got to the point where I knew his daughter's life inside and out because he would talk about his daughter all the time. And I finally met his daughter and his daughter said, you know, I don't think my dad, you know, really, really cares or, you know, or, or you know, pays attention. He's never at my musicals. He's never, you know, at my honor roll ceremony. Um, you know, and I, I essentially said to her, I was like, you have no idea, you know, like how much your dad talks about you. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, and how much he cares about you, how much he loves you. And I think like it's difficult, you know, because he has the best intentions, but his, his work took him away. Um, so I think that's also something for artists to think about is that, you know, no matter how good your intentions are, it's not the easiest thing to live a sustainable life with because it's not a normal way to live. Mm -hmm. um, so as far as being in a more supportive um, role now, that was one of the considerations that I made in going into law is that I have the option to make a living staying in the same city all the time if I want to which you can create was, a home base and create a home and right. make that balance exactly. yeah exactly and yeah I don't have to leave town or uproot myself all the time to in order to survive. for the work yeah right mm -hmm. yeah no and, and this is something that came up also in, in a different way when Greta and I were speaking when I was a guest which was you know I've come to terms with the fact that like you're you kill it at something but you can't kill it at everything right. like sometimes when it comes to that work thing you know so the idea is some days I feel like I've done a lot for the community and my kids are total screen heads or some days I've parented really well and I feel like I haven't supported artists you know what I mean so it is hard to find that balance but I can't even fathom for an artist that's on the road how yeah. much harder because they're actually physically away from that home right. base like if I can't do it while I'm sharing four walls with people I can't <laughs> imagine how I do it if I was across the country you know yeah. like right. Yeah. 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 Well, I'm going to, I'm going to wrap us out. I'm going to ask both of you a, a, a final thought question, which is what are you most grateful for today in sharing a house with one another? I will go first. I am just most grateful that Edward is here and that we're able to be together for this weekend, because it's been a long time since we've seen him. We were talking, it's been like, you know, 10 months or something. Wow. So, you know, yeah, we oh, on Zoom, we talk on the phone, but I am just thrilled to have him here. So that is what I am most grateful for, for today and for this weekend. And then I'm just grateful for him, I'm grateful to, to have him. He's my only child, Ed and I just had one. And uh, we are just delighted um, with him, with um, the life choices that he's made, just with with everything. You know, we've we're just we're thrilled. We're thrilled. Who's saying home cooking? <laughs> oh, Edward would be happy. I think I think Sean's answering on behalf of Edward, saying home cooking. He's he's grateful. <laughs> he's grateful for whatever you're making this weekend. Is what he's grateful. For. Absolutely, absolutely. That is hilarious. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, I'm grateful for um, you know my parents, and I'm grateful for my health. Um, I'm grateful. I think you know this whole process of COVID has really um, changed our perspectives and things that we you know, took for granted or things that we never really appreciated, we now do. And um, so I'm just grateful for everything, you know, and, and uh, you know, and, and yeah, so I, and, and I'm grateful for having the foresight to just be grateful too. And just, you know, no complaints. That's great. Love it. That's great. And if we could carry that sense of gratitude yes. into the rest of it, right? And maintain right. that sense of gratitude, that impression, that fingerprint That's impression, right? right? That's yeah. right. You know what? I just sent Henrique um, one of Edward's songs that he's written and sung. So Henrique, do you have that? Can you play it? He said, you got it. Okay. So maybe- we Oh, I'm excited. Yes. This will be an outro. Look yeah. at that. See? 
You didn't even you didn't even know that you were going to play yourself out, did you? I, I had no that? idea. No. <laughs> <laughs> it just came to me. <laughs> it's brilliant. It's brilliant. Yeah. Well, as as Henry cues that up, maybe we'll really just let it play us out today. Um, I want to say thank you to both of you guys for making this time together and letting us get to know Edward through this platform and the two of you together kind of corporately through the space as well. It's been really great to, to sit in and listen to you talk today. Thanks, Jess. Thank you so much. Yeah. It's been a pleasure. Thanks very much for including me. Absolutely. Yeah, it's, it's, and it's and, and I am so excited to get to know you also through the Coffer Center board. Yeah. Um, so friends of the Coffer Center, Edward is a friend of yours as well. He'll be here with us and working through our space with you. So I'm, I'm happy that we've been able to debut your relationship to us in this space as well. This has been great. Thank you. And Henrique, whenever you're ready, if you have that song, I will, I will wish everyone a good rest of their day. And, uh, and, and we have Deb Dotzer next week. I will say that too. We have Deb Dotzer next Deb week Dotzer. sitting down with us. Yep. Looking forward to that. Happy Mother's Day to everyone. Happy Mother's Day. Mother's Day. <laughs>